Hello, and welcome to Digital Futures Conversations on Inclusivity Series. Uh, my name is Viana Bogosian. Uh, I'm an architect and also immersive media designer uh, focused on issues of environmental data, environmental literacy, and environmental policy. I'm extremely honored to moderate this session today focused on environmental justice and issues. The series um, focused on uh, a, a entitled conversation on inclusivity focuses on imminent uh, issues that we're facing today. And one of the most important ones, uh, if not the most important one is environmental crisis that we're facing. Uh, the goal of this series is to facilitate open dialogue on the role of critical design, thinking, making, and computation to focus on and facilitate equitable uh, solutions for uh, immediate and imminent uh, issues. And this panel specifically focuses on the nuance and complex nature of environmental issues and environmental conversations. And uh, here we're going to have presentations and panelists that are presenting a wide range of, uh, of focus, research focus areas from role of design, activism, data management, mapping, geopolitical activities, and also um, all the way to policy making. Now, uh, when we're talking about environmental justice or environmental issues, um, let's say if we're only uh, focusing on the trajectory in the United States, although a lot of visualization and activism led to uh, formulation of policies uh, through environmental protection agency, but conversation around environmental justice and nuanced nature and its connectivity to race and discrimination and income was only brought into play in early 1980s. Uh, and since then, there's been a lot of different variation and a lot of different um, administration that have focused on uh, whether funding and research and attention was allocated to these conversations. So if anything, these conversations are extremely nuanced and these are systematic issues that are dealing with environmentalism, civil rights, social justice, racism, and data management. And data management aspect is one that I think more than ever uh, since um, we are uh, more than ever living in this world of data deluge is it becomes in forefront of conversation. It's definitely something that we will address with our panelists today. And ultimately, all of these components, um, the conversation will turn around and center around policy and environmental literacy. So how do we uh, create culture of, uh, culture of a conversation around environmental issues? How could these conversations then potentially lead to policy? But we understand that when we're discussing environmental issues and environmental justice, um, this column on the left, is where a lot of action uh, comes in. And this panel specifically looks at the role of design, role of, in this case, participatory action, activism uh, in this conversation. Panelists today are uh, in different uh, degree involved in academia. So we will see uh, array of uh, research and practice uh, so we're very excited to uh, have this conversation along with them. So we will begin uh, the session today by uh, inviting each panelist to present their ongoing research before engaging in a conversation together. So our uh, first panelist today is uh, Hadley Arno. Uh, Hadley, uh, I had the pleasure of meeting Hadley when I was an undergraduate student at Woodbury University where uh, I took a studio with Hadley and Peter Arnold, which allowed us to not only understand uh, uh, water issues surrounding Los Angeles, but also really understand that local issues are often part of larger global issues or network of issues. So in order for us to understand nuances of water issues in Los Angeles, we took a trip all the way through many states to really trace water and understand how socio-spatial dynamics and policies and infrastructure affects these conversations. So I'm very honored to have Hadley joining us today. 
Uh, so Hadley, uh, Arnold's work focuses on bringing water scarcity and climate uh, adaptation to the forefront of design education practice and policy in dry lands. Hadley received her BA from Harvard and her MR from SIARC. She has taught urban uh, history, theory, and design studios at SIAR, UCLA, and Woodbury. She has lectured extensively in the US and abroad. Hadley Arnold serves as uh, executive director of the Arid Lands Institute at Woodbury University. Arid Land Institute's mission is to advance design innovation at the nexus of water, energy, and climate change. Her current public initiative, which I'm very excited to hear more about, uh, Divining LA is a multi-layer collaboration designed to advance research, design vision, and ambitious public engagement for a water resilient future. And here we'll see also a strong tie to computation. So I'm very excited to welcome Hadley. Thank you, Bayana. Are you able to hear me? Yes. Okay, great. And are you able to see a Blue slide. Great. Yes. Uh, thank you so much for uh, including us in the conversation today. Uh, super important conversation. And we too remember your studio uh, with um, not just fondness, but inspiration. You guys were a tenacious, curious, determined bunch. And you can't imagine how gratifying it is uh, a certain number of years later uh, to see you as a leader in this uh, field of thinking out our climate adapted uh, futures. So thank you. Um, it is true that we did some work as educators, as researchers, uh, uh, public programming, and a lot of field work in the years that um, uh, we were coming to know Brianna and other students. Um, we crisscrossed the US West as part of the Arid Lands Institute looking closely at a variety of water systems and the history of how uh, peoples had uh, adapted to a uh, severe climate in the past. We um, have transitioned uh, away from some of that uh, work and are now really focused on applied work, really about the future and about adaptation and accelerating it. Uh, but I wanna be sure it's not seen as a, a kind of false binary and that it is very much a uh, continuum. Uh, from the field work that we uh, did for years uh, across the American Southwest, we included uh, indigenous, traditional, vernacular, uh, colonial, industrial uh, infrastructures as part of a kind of field of study. How are we ever going to know what adaptation looks like if uh, we don't have a feel for how we've not only organized material and matter and energy around the distribution of water, but also how we've organized space and how we've organized social networks around uh, the distribution of water. So the American Southwest was our classroom for a number of years, and I'm, I'm glad we had a chance to share that together. Uh, the, it's not the only classroom uh, with something to offer in the uh, realm of how have people built their water systems to uh, adapt over uh, history. Uh, we have um, uh, looked at a range of systems in a, uh, a spectrum of uh, societies all over the globe. That more recent work that I was in that uh, slide comes from the beginnings of an atlas of drylands design, begun with a wonderful cohort of thesis students in the uh, USC Masters of Landscape and Architecture, uh, Landscape Architecture and Urbanism uh, program uh, just last year. Uh, when looked at ancient hearts all over the world, we identified just a few systems and really tried to categorize them and create a kind of taxonomy and draw them in a standardized way so that we could ask particular questions that have relevance, have value, have currency today. Part of what I think maybe might be included in what you call uh, environmental literacy. This is not the first time we have had to invent our ways of being in water scarce environments, hot, dry environments. Um, so what was the problem historically? Um, of course, uh, that can be defined any number of ways, but when looking for commonalities, uh, adaptation to extreme arid environments, uh, in each of the many uh, systems we've begun to look at, and there are hundreds more that remain to be cataloged, documented, drawn out, analyzed, 
uh, obviously uh, wringing maximal value from uh, a system is a uh, sort of basic first principle. Uh, drinking water, hygiene, food, cooling, habitat, really importantly, public space, ritual space, ceremonial space. How do you get all of this out of the design of what we would call today a green infrastructure, an infrastructure with no carbon added? Lots of energy added in the form of labor, lots of energy added in the form of good design, smart design, gravity-fed design, opportunistic design, but not carbon. So uh, is there anything there in uh, the act of design moving away from intensive use of energy, capital, technology to solve uh, water problems and a kind of return to what, what does ingenuity look like? Super importantly, in these systems that we look at, uh, we what you always see is it's never just a physical system. Each system is also a social system, a network designed to uh, support, maintain, operate, manage, and uh, a, a water system, a shared water system in the spaces it supports for all the various multiple purposes mentioned, uh, not only in, um, in times of good, shall we say, or times of plenty, but super importantly, uh, in the face of stressors and uh, shocks, disruptions to the system, that social network around the system becomes the infrastructure itself in the face of uh, damage, drought, earthquake, um, uh, whatever, shock or stress or uh, population growth. So the coupling of a physical system with a social system in order to be well adapted to a natural system uh, comes up uh, in, with, um, uh, you know, incredible frequency uh, in the study of these systems. What does that have to do with uh, future water? What does it have to do with today? This is um, the GRACE satellite mapping that Jay Familietti leads. Uh, this map is drawn from his work and is published on the Pew Charitable Trust uh, pages under the, uh, uh, in, in, as part of the publication called Future Water. Um, the uh, map is an important one. It is uh, our best and most recent intelligence on What's it looking like in terms of a changing hydrologic sphere? We know basically in layperson's terms, wet will be wetter, dry will be drier. But this gives us a quick snapshot of the, the uh, three or four main uh, challenges that as designers, as citizens, as planners, as taxpayers, as innovators, as entrepreneurs, we wanna be working uh, carefully into with good problem definition. Uh, emerging classes of water haves and water have nots. Uh, where you see red, uh, as you can imagine, is uh, hotter, drier, and less water. Where you see blue is increased uh, frequency, increased intensity of rain events and uh, uh, flooding. Uh, we, you see, obviously, uh, more um, of the world high latitude regions, including the northern half of the US, as well as global tropics, uh, getting wetter uh, simultaneously along that mid belt to which the American West and Southwest parts of belong. Uh, we see the arid and, and semi-arid belt uh, getting hotter and drier. Um, importantly, and I'm gonna just sort of note this a couple of times during the course of these slides, uh, the time frame that we're all looking at in terms of the urgency, uh, the need for acceleration, the need for velocity, uh, is changing in real time. When we started this work so many years ago, uh, it was considered a little alarmist. Uh, the IPCC predicted these changes that Grace picked up on in 2017, 2018, uh, predicted it by the end of the 21st century. And uh, these are actually the impacts that we're um, seeing now. Three specific uh, hydrologic um, impacts. One, overdrawn uh, groundwater, water that took eons to build up in the world's aquifers being withdrawn at rates that it cannot be uh, recharged. We see that everywhere from California to uh, Bangladesh, Northwestern India, parts of Asia. Number two, increased flooding. We see that in the upper Midwest. We see it in Alberta, Canada. We see it in Calgary. We see it in the Amazon. Uh, we see it in parts of Africa. Flooding is the most common and costly natural disaster in the US. Uh, it significantly affects homes, businesses, infrastructures, and the environment to the tune of about $850 billion in damages and losses since 2000. The third, of course, is drought. 
uh, and while I have my roots in drought uh, and adaptation in dry lands, uh, the, the adaptation to climate requires that we also be looking at the, uh, the wet applications of our work, uh, so flood as well. So uh, drought, hotspots, uh, California, Texas, Sao Paulo, Eastern Europe, uh, parts of Asia and the Inland Seas. Um, economically, it's a trillion dollar problem. And why in part we have transitioned uh, our work, or our work has evolved out of um, a kind of pure sense of discovery and exploration and uh, um, research and teaching and more into the applied and markets. We're now building um, decision support tools to bring to market because it's a trillion dollar pro uh, excuse me, a trillion dollar problem. And what that means is it will require every source of investment. Um, and working on um, a project by project basis, or, or, or merely within education or NGOs uh, uh, is important, but not sufficient. There needs to be a case made that there can be a return on investment, uh, not just a moral imperative uh, to mitigate and, uh, and adapt. For every dollar spent on risk reduction measures, somebody needs to be convinced uh, that as the National uh, uh, Building Sciences Institute has, has said, that for every dollar spent on mitigation, six is saved uh, in disaster costs. Socially, uh, we are approaching uh, the year in which over half of the world's population will reside in water stressed areas. Uh, uh, Two billion people already lack access to safe drinking water at home. Economic inequality, of course, compounds uh, unevenly distributed uh, climate impacts. We've seen that in Chennai, India. We've seen that in Cape Town. We're seeing it in the uh, in, in North America. Um, so our job is to identify not only where will uh, this water be at these larger regional scales, but down to very, very, very tight scale. I'm gonna quickly show you a short piece of a video and then I'm gonna jump because I'm concerned I'm gonna burn through other people's time. Um, so give me one moment. I'm gonna stop sharing this screen and I'm going to go to a uh, video. that uh, shows you uh, a little tiny demo of what we're doing in a technology we call Hazel. It's an AI supported platform for identifying flood risk and groundwater recharge opportunities in any city, wet or dry. And that's where our work's a little different than when we first started working together, Bina. Uh, so this is Houston, a city that knows a lot about what it means to not understand your risk well and be hit by increasingly large rain events that have a slower decay period over land. Um, so let me see if I can um, get through this. We're zooming in on Houston on the uh, Gulf Coast. This is a six square mile area where uh, FEMA uh, has, of course, mapped a floodplain, a 100-year floodplain shown in brown here. This is what a lot of planning and decision making in the United States is uh, based on our FEMA flood maps, the National Flood Insurance Program, uh, your insurance rates, your ability to get insured, where you can get a building permit or not is based on mapping that's not accurate. Hazel can show you our technology, our platform, by doing uh, physics-based modeling that the uh, risk is not just in the FEMA floodplains, neither 100 year nor 500 year. There are plenty of properties at risk outside the floodplain. And super importantly, the character of the risk within the floodplain is not accurately um, uh, described. It varies greatly. So uh, within the floodplain, property to property, the uh, flood inundation levels are not well understood uh, by FEMA. Yes, there are other CAT models out there. None are modeling overland flows of rain on dense urban centers uh, quite the way we are. So we go zooming in on what looks like an ordinary uh, piece of the built environment. In this case, the building in the upper left is a grocery store. The building on the right is a, a big box store. The small building on the left, the one we're zooming in on is a critical piece of infrastructure. Uh, as a grocery store, it is deemed essential in a storm, in an emergency, must stay open, must have its supply chains working. But it does, if it doesn't have the right information about how much water is in its parking lot, up against its loading docks or against its walls, 
it's operating in a vacuum. Bid box was high and dry and Harvey grocery store was inundated. The grocery store, um, uh, just want to get some uh, super accurate down to a half meter square and sub centimeter in depth accuracy around uh, what are the impacts of flooding at this scale. And goal is not to just do grocery stores. The goal is to model the world and have this data be applicable in uh, in any situation. But I'm showing you this as a demonstration of a piece of the model that's been built. So it's a full 2D uh, model, meaning that it's been uh, physically modeled, the flows of rain. Problem is, without access to that information, you make mistakes. The building uh, could have been cited differently. Its mitigation measures could have been better. They weren't. Water was flowing fast in two directions on the site. And eventually, the uh, site, I'm just going to speed up here, the spite, uh, site had to be uh, scraped after Harvey. So there were uh, tremendous losses from business disruption, from then scraping the site, rebuilding, uh, and mitigating more effectively uh, post-Harvey. Uh, that's one one building, one storm, um, and the the what's of course behind this work is how do you get everybody ready for a whole lot more Harvey-sized storms in vulnerable cities like Houston, but not exclusively Houston. We're training our AI typologically on some wet cities and some dry cities, and then the hope is, of course, to scale them outside of North America. We're data rich in North America. We're not as data rich in every part of the world. So uh, that's a, a gap maybe we can talk about and come back to in um, uh, conversations later. So uh, the point being transcalar thinking, you've got to get it right at the scale of individual communities, really specific sites, and at the scale of uh, regions and uh, their vulnerabilities uh, at, at, at scale. I am going, in the, in the interest of time, I'm going to just stop. And um, if there are more uh, points we can come back to during the discussion, we will. But I want to be careful about other people's uh, time. Thank you so much, Javi. This is uh, great to see a uh, really uh, inspiring. Uh, uh, I uh, completely agree that um, there is this general um, maybe sense, and this comes from uh, some of the headlines in 1910s. Uh, we are living in a world of the big data. Uh, we're surrounded by data. There was a really interesting a uh, story in The Economist in 2010 with the title Data Deluge, which kind of created this uh, illusion that if we, uh, the issue of data resolution is something that would be solved on its own, then uh, it's just a matter of applying the right analysis. But the, uh, in, in actuality, um, information resolution is still a very, very important uh, uh, it's a very important issue, uh, and uh, some of it has to do with, obviously, uh, who controls the data, um, and the other aspect is the fact that the data is not generated yet. I also want to say it's really important who you're sharing the data with, because the whole point here, the goal of a good tool is to empower people. So showing that data to people who can see through their lens, which is return on investment, where should I be spending a limited budget as effectively as possible, really that's where it's, it's actually about catalyzing finance. I really think that is where a tremendous amount of our energy needs to be going is designing in order to make the case to the people who are writing the checks. And those checks are gonna be written from a broad set of, of sectors, not just one. And uh, I am an assistant professor in Florida International University in Miami where uh, last week we had a, a building collapse. I'm sure you're aware of it. and. Those are due to sinkholes and assessments that are not uh, still uh, often calculated with the uh, current simulation tools. So really truly understand how to use our um, uh, machine learning, reinforcement learning, and multi-model uh, uh, computational tools to be able to uh, create this assessment. And perhaps with an additional field work that could be quite important. So with that, uh, we're going to invite our uh, second speaker to, um, to present. Uh, I will uh, introduce uh, Gabriel. Um, 
Uh, I'm very excited to actually um, see Gabriel's work in con uh, after uh, Hadley's work. Uh, I was introduced to Gabriel's work um, a, a few years ago uh, through the uh, mapping uh, uh, projects that uh, he had released, but also uh, his publications. Uh, so I'm very excited to see this in conversation. So Gabriel Kozlowski is a Brazilian architect and curator and currently working as the assistant curator for the 17 International Architectural Exhibition, La Biennale di Venezia 2021, um, which we know the title, How Will We, How Will we Live Together is quite uh, timely in the context of what we've been um, what we're discussing today, but also what we've uh, all gone through in the past year and a half. His recent books are uh, his recent books are The World as an Architectural Project, which I highly recommend. Uh, reactions for afterwards and walls of air. Um, uh, he's now a PhD student at the Harvard Graduate School of Design. He's the co-founder of two independent initiatives, uh, and his uh, Tomorrow New Org is a philanthropic response to the COVID-19 crisis that gathers um, thoughts and donations to uh, to both help those impacted by the virus and collectively imagine our future post-pandemic. Entire um, Entre is a collective that explores urban transformations through the medium of enterprise. I'm looking forward to seeing your presentation, Gabriel. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, let me share my screen. Um, so just to confirm, you see here, right? Yes. Okay. Um, well, it's uh, it, it, it's 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 great to follow uh, Hadley's fantastic presentation. So I'm gonna do my best to keep the <laughs> the the level. <laughs> uh, but it was interesting because when I initially got invited, I thought I was just going to present a previous presentation. But yesterday night, I got a little bit of time and got excited about trying to combine some of my different lines of research into one uh, cohesive presentation uh, in order to offer more content for the, for the discussion. So rather than presenting just one work in depth, I decided to, to do a more of a rapid fire of, of three of my current works, where I believe design plays a critical role in addressing environmental concerns, both at the local and, and global scales. So I've divided the presentation in three parts. Uh, according to three actions that I, that I believe are crucial to start building a more inclusive future. Imagine, visualize, and empower. And each uh, action will correspond to one work that deals with a specific time frame. So one looks at our history, another one to our present, and the last one uh, points towards the future. So the first one is our most recent book, uh, The World as an Architectural Project, developed with uh, Hashin Sarkis and, and Roy Salguero and published by MIT Press in 2020. And the book explores how architectural practices have addressed the scale of the world as a spatial, cultural, and political construction. And the research puts together a genealogy of architects who over the last 150 years have looked at the world as a scale for architectural imagination and intervention. Um, if the first one is about imagination, the second one is about visualization. And this is a critical mapping work that I developed for the 2018 uh, Venice Biennale when I was a co-curator of the Brazilian Pavilion. And here I put together a quick brief of a TEDx talk that I, that I believe it captures a little bit of the spirit of the work. And it's, a, it's a kind of a, a 50 second video and it's called uh, Cartographies to Empower Democracy. Uh, the full video is there on TED if it's interesting.
And the third work um, is, is the show that we just opened in Venice, the Architecture Biennale of 2021, that was, um, that has Hashin Sarkis as the, uh, who is the Dean of uh, the MIT School of Architecture as the main curator and myself as one of the two assistant curators. And I'm framing this today as a platform to empower practices and collectives that are engaging with uh, pressing environmental challenges. And uh, so the first one, the world as an architectural project brings together 50 projects that have engaged with, the, engaged with and confronted the world as a totality. So they imagined architecture as a device able to comment and intervene at such a scale. Uh, an important component, uh, component for, um, the, uh, uh, sorry, just one second. So uh, an important component for the architects that we selected is their position vis-a-vis -vis the scale, was to understand how they, they frame the arguments to properly address these conditions. And these are conditions that pertain to humanity as a whole and not to only um, a single a building or, or, or a neighborhood or something. So for example, um, the terms these architects used help us to start understanding their intentions, be the terms world, earth, planet, globe, ecumeny, globalization, or anthropocene. So these notions became clues that uh, kind of flagged these architects' works for us uh, when we're starting the research pro uh, process that led uh, to the book. So registering those words also brought to the foreground the different understandings of the planet as each of them has uh, very different conceptual uh, meanings and, and potentially projective connotations. So for instance, our own use of the word, of the world, the word world uh, in the title presents earth as a social construct, uh, which can be placed against a more, for instance, uh, physical implication of the term planet or a more contemporary and ecological dimension of the Anthropocene. So the 50 projects that we present usually work at the intersection uh, with other disciplines. For instance, several emphasize the role of geography or anthropology or the role that uh, economics have, have played in influencing architectural thinking. And they understand the role of architecture not only as one of intervening in the physical environment, but also one of imagining the future of societies in relation to the planet. And crucially, these are uh, projects focused on global questions. Um, because their project focuses on global question, it's important that they incorporate as much geographic and gender diversity as possible. So this was also challenging because, and, and despite the fact that we included architects from 30 countries, when we see the, our table of contents, it becomes evident that the most, um, um, were, the most projects they have been produced uh, in the global north and by men which is an important realization to have if we are to change the scenario moving forward. So to analyze these projects, we build a kind of a matrix showing some of the interrelations that we found between them. And on the left, we have the architects, on the right, we have the themes, and they include topics such as autonomy, colonialism, cybernetics, ecology, nomadism, territorial identification, global urbanization, um, which are questions that we're actually still confronting today. And many of the projects we selected, um, just by the fact that they intended to address questions pertaining to the world, end up uh, dealing with environmental and ecolog ecological concerns. And in the sense, and to a certain extent, by selecting which entries to read, one can trace how environmental thinking has uh, been addressed by our discipline throughout modernity. And we have canonical figures such as Buckminster Fuller uh, or Yves Klein and Global Hunt or less uh, known groups, such as this one coming from the Valparaiso School of Architecture in Chile, who proposed to reconceive the place of South America in relation to the world and the role of the Amazon as our inland sea, as they put it, have played on our understanding of the South American civilization. And here I just extracted a couple of examples just as, as food for thought. So we have, for instance, Super Studio with their five fundamental acts or Juan Navarro Badlevec with Gates, uh, Doxiades with the Kumanopolis, the Brazilian Sergio Bernardes envisioning the world in the cybernetics area. Two contemporary cases, such as the collective world of matter discussing extractive territories, uh, New Brenner and the Urban Theory Lab discussing global urbanization, uh, Joyce uh, Shen and, and Bimal Mendes visualizing the current conditions that allow us to see the planet as one single city of 7 billion. 
And, and here is where I start transitioning to the second part of the presentation about my own work on cartography and, and visualization. So this work uh, is based on an understanding that uh, many of the problems that we either don't understand or can't address are because we cannot see them. So the same way we say that a properly formulated question contains half of its answer, to visualize is the first step to understand the challenges we face and to move forward towards confronting them. Uh, with this research project, we developed um, alongside that we developed alongside 200 uh, collaborations. We generated 10 maps that represent 10 different faces of Brazil. Uh, they talk about the Amazon, the political board of the country, the flow of people through immigration, the flow of materials through the movement of commodities, how capital is specialized um, in the Brazilian territory, and so on. So today, I'll quickly present uh, one of these maps. Um, this is a map entirely painted in blue um, with data from atmospheric humidity we got from NASA's website. And you can see that um, over the Amazon forest, uh, we have the higher intensity of, um, of blue. But you can also see that, that there is, I'm oh, sorry, um, but you also see that there is a tongue of blue that moves from the north to the southeast of the country where most uh, prosperous and, and big cities lie. So we start, we start trying to understand well, what was this phenomena, and we looked at the wind regimes. And we realized that uh, wind that's coming from, uh, from, that's being pulled from the Atlantic Ocean is redirected towards the center, the center of the continent, hits the Antis mountain, and is redirected towards um, uh, the southeast uh, of the country, where our biggest cities, cities lie. This phenomenon is called the flying rivers. <laughs> and if you see Hadley's map before, uh, uh, you can see that the south of Brazil, in relation to all our other areas in the same uh, latitude, should, should have been uh, desert. But it's not because of a phenomena at the continental scale um, that brings water from the Amazon to our big cities. And this shows intrinsic connection between north and south of the country, um, which, as I told you before, is, is where uh, wealth is concentrated uh, in Brazil. And if you see how the Amazon is distorted based on, on the cap capital accumulation, it becomes just like a very shrinked area. So in the sense that even if you don't care about um, uh, the environment or about the Amazon forest and just uh, care about making money on our big cities, uh, you're also going to face the consequences of the de deforestation, the rampant deforestation that um, we're feeling, we're experiencing nowadays in Brazil. Um, and to see how we are impacting this phenomena, uh, we mapped uh, along with the Global Forest Watch all the, the deforestation spots from yellow to red, you have a gradient of how much carbon emissions being thrown in the atmosphere, which shows the intensity of the deforestation. So although I don't um, specifically draw the border of Brazil, you can almost see the country based on where deforestation stops and, and, and where it uh, continues. And if you pay attention to the areas and overlap them to the indigenous lands, uh, you see that uh, the only areas that are not burning in the Amazon are actually uh, coincide with the areas that are indigenous reserves. So, um, although in this, you see in, in, sorry, in orange, you see the indigenous reserves, in red, you see the, the, the areas that are being uh, burned or deforestated. So, we are currently facing a very uh, serious situation with our government, with our uh, uh, pseudo fascist government, that they're trying to dismantle indigenous reserves, uh, kill indigenous people and open ground for the agribusiness. And that's why um, um, there are many initiatives nowadays, and this is one of my initiatives, um, that are trying to, to redirect resources to the indigenous communities and try to, uh, to protect uh, our people and, and at the same time protect our forests. Uh, what we did uh, instead of, we were doing a sequence of exhibitions about our maps, but at some point we realized it was a moment to actually transform them into direct support on the ground. So we put them for auction and, and we start selling these maps and redirecting the money towards um, 
uh, helping this population. This is one of the people who bought the map, for instance. And the last part of the exhibition um, is our curatorial role at the, I'm gonna be super quick. Uh, I think I'm already about to be over time. Um, so it's our curatorial role for the Venus Architecture Biennale of this year. Um, so Hashim, who's the main curator, he conceived the event around the question of how will we live together, which naturally brings answers that deal not only with architecture, but with broader understandings of humanity in relation to itself and in relation to the planet, the environment and nature as a whole. So I bring um, the Biennale today because uh, that's one of the most powerful platforms to discuss where our profession is heading towards. And one that actually we decided to point to the future and not necessarily to the present. And, and knowing that uh, we use our curatorial vantage points to give voice and power practices that have been that have uh, important messages to convey to the world and in terms of reimagining the future we can aspire to achieve. We structured just the show in five categories from body to planet. And so how we live together among other beings, how we live together as new households, as emerging communities across borders and as one planet. So I don't have enough time uh, to go in, uh, in depth, but I extracted a couple of examples just to illustrate uh, what I've been discussing. And, and although there are only a, a handful within a much broader pool of those examples that directly engage with questions pertaining to the environment, um, through these works, we can see, we can uh, think about our relationship with nature and how we can create more inclusive, inclusive futures between us uh, and other species. So this is the work of Ecologic Studio, studio on algae, the work of effect on sustainable uh, communities, I, um, the work of Gringo Cardia on indigenous peoples uh, of the Amazon, uh, the work um, of Dan Magica and Gary Setzer uh, on migration, new migration patterns, animal migration patterns based on the current climate uh, changes that we're gonna see in the coming years. Uh, the work of Ooze on, on uh, redesigning uh, our using urban design as a way to readdress some questions pertaining uh, natural resources and, and energy production. The work of Pinar Yodas on uh, ocean, on criticizing the practices um, that we see nowadays taking place in our oceans and their effects like ocean acidification and overfishing and etc. Richard Weller talking about a global uh, linear park or Cave Bureau talking about our roots and, and uh, to our cave ancestors and, and, and how we are kind of um, um, disrupting sort of heritage to the way we extract energy. <laughs> and in the end, there uh, was one room in which every single participant brought an item that they found uh, relevant uh, or are, are meaningful. And, and Olafur Eliasson created this space called Assembly of the Future. So this is almost like a kind of a, a forum in which e each one brings a sort of item that represents uh, what they want to talk uh, about the world. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, what really stands out in your work is um, in, uh, focus on curation and also correlation. So uh, you also talked about the importance of information visualization and information communication, which is something that will come across through everybody, all the panelists' presentation today. But uh, it is really important to note that um, information visualization uh, has been the key way that environmental uh, policies and justice have been pushed forward. So from 1958, healing curve where for the first time we began to plot CO2 and begin to really uh, track change that one graph alone uh, was a uh, birth of modern environmental movement so uh, hopefully new ways of looking for information visualization and correlation would allow us to then push forward new policies and new conversations thank you so much our uh, next uh, speaker is uh, Ricardo Dominguez. Um, Ricardo Dominguez's name is, uh, at least for me, uh, and um, a lot of people in media arts is synonymous with uh, artivism or hacktivism. 
Uh, I was first introduced to Ricardo Dominguez's work when I joined uh, USC School of Cinematic Arts in the Media Arts PhD program, where one of my uh, cohorts, Misha Cardenas, had uh, recently uh, been collaborating with Ricardo on uh, one of the uh, projects that I hope uh, we'll be seeing today. Um, and uh, I will uh, read Ricardo's uh, bio, a brief bio. Uh, Ricardo Dominguez was a founding member of Critical Art Ensemble and a co-founder of Electrical, uh, e Electronic Disturbance Theater 1.0, a group who uh, developed virtual sit-in technologies in solidarity with the Zapatistas communities in uh, Chiapas. Mexico in 1998 with Electronic Disturbance Theater 2.0 um, with Brett uh, Stalbaum, Michelle Cardenas, Amy Park Carroll, and L. Um, Mehramand. Uh, he co-founded the Transporter Immigration Tool, a GPS cell phone safety net tool for crossing the Mexico-US border, uh, which was the winner of Transnational Communities Award in 2008. Uh, what's really important about this work is um, all the activist conversation that this uh, work um, generated. Uh, the transporter immigration tool was also under investigation by the US Congress, the FBI, Homeland Security, UCSD, and um, I, I hope it's okay to say that jeopardized uh, Ricardo's um, uh, tenure appointment uh, for a while and uh, UCOP uh, in 2009 to 2010 and was uh, reviewed by Glenn Beck in 2010 as a gesture that potentially dissolved the US border with its poetry. Ricardo was a, a society uh, for the Humanities Fellow at uh, Cornell University's and Arts and Humanities Rockefeller Fellow and many, many others. So I'm extremely honored to invite uh, Ricardo um, to engage in this conversation. Thank you. Thank you so much for the introduction and thank you for inviting me to be part of this uh, really amazing uh, group of researchers. Uh, I don't often have conversations at this level of architectural thinking and strategic thinking, which I really learn a great deal about uh, as I go um, through the process of learning with all of you. So I guess the difference um, that between the work that we've seen so far and the work I am doing is the difference perhaps between strategic thinking, uh, planetary thinking, which is so vital and necessary. And uh, my work would fall more into tactical uh, thinking, uh, micro gestures that are small and perhaps offer moments of reflection that can speak to the planetary strategy uh, in, in a different sort of calculus and question of design. Um, so uh, just for lack of a better definition, uh, using the poetry of my partner, Amy Sarah Carroll, I'm gonna ask who put the scene in the Anthropocene? I'm very interested in staging and theater and performance. So uh, uh, the question of staging cultural vaccines during planetary catastrophes. And my response has always been uh, in the small uh, arena. And even though it's in the face of what all of you have so clearly put forth are planetary uh, catastrophes. And so I'll begin, I was born in the catastrophe of the border. I was born in El Paso, Texas, uh, which, as we know, is a calculus of, uh, as Teddy Cruz says, uh, the equator of political violence, if you will. Uh, even though I don't remember it because I, my family moved to Las Vegas uh, when I was only a few months old. So I started learning from Las Vegas about the planetary scale disasters we were going to face 24 seven culture. Uh, mafia capitalism conjoined with military capitalism, conjoined with uh, nuclear research and alien culture, uh, neon capital. I don't know. You could just sort of uh, add all those things that we were uh, learning from Las Vegas. I sort of began very early. Uh, with my mother, we would watch nuclear bombs 100 miles away uh, every month. Uh, I don't know if any of you have been near nuclear bombs when they go off, but it's different than an earthquake. Uh, they are oceanic. There are waves that come. And so we would run out into the streets at, uh, at during Saturdays, the sirens would go off 
and a minute later we would surf the waves, right? of nuclear weapons. And so we were told that this was to protect us from the Cold War uh, alien and entities. And so it was a nationalistic uh, 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 dome of protection, this nuclear explosions. But when I turned on my old black and white RCA portable television, that right after the nuclear blast, I would see films that would uh, create cultural imaginaries that would say, these bombs are going to create monsters, monstrosities uh, in the desert of the real. Even Las Vegas itself was destroyed uh, by these monsters, right, that were created by nuclear clouds. So for me, it was a very schizoanalytic space between the nationalism I was taught in schools and what my screenal culture told me was a danger zone, a destructive planetary catastrophe that we were under. So I didn't fully understand all of this, but it was certainly a hot zone uh, that is pervasive in the culture um, that I encountered. Uh, out of this period of time, I then landed in the late 70s in uh, Tallahassee, Florida, where we started Critical Art Ensemble. And Critical Art Ensemble was a group of radical artists who were interested in the cultural frontier and creating micro gestures that would investigate the uh, emergence of data bodies uh, versus real bodies or what we defined as virtual capitalism. We didn't have computers, but in the early eighties, we began to hear the echoes of a digital culture. Uh, one of these spaces of exploration was what were these bunkers of new digital culture uh, that were taking over the public square and it was malls as far as we were concerned. Malls were the kind of local catastrophe of data gathering, surveillance, containment and the simulation of public culture. So I would do these micro gestures that would create a, a, a theater where surveillance and police forces would come and stop you from using commodities at the edge of these uh, cultures. And so these micro gestures are something I repeat over and over. Uh, here, uh, of course, you were safe to shop in these areas, right? So surveillance was the predominant issue in these early mall cultures of the 80s. And so um, that was for us a kind of catastrophe of the gathering of data bodies and real bodies and this kind of screenality. Um, out of this then came our encounter with ACT UP, AIDS Coalition to Unleash Power. We started ACT UP Tallahassee, another planetary catastrophe, if you will, the pandemic. And that really forced us to take our theories and hit the ground uh, and start developing what we call community research initiatives, uh, because the NIH and even Dr. Fauci, who's uh, our, one of our uh, sort of uh, clear voices at this moment, uh, was not articulating uh, the practice of research that was necessary to save the lives of the hysteria that we found ourselves in, in HIV and AIDS culture. So Critical Art Ensemble started ACT UP Tallahassee as part of a community research initiative, working with uh, chemists and biologists and other communities who were uh, involved or had AIDS in order to uh, develop a, a, a response, a community response. Uh, working with Grand Fury, we hit uh, Reagan and the policies of uncaring uh, and started designing gestures uh, that spoke in newspapers, that spoke on the public square, in the streets, and also for Critical Art Ensemble, the development of electronic civil disobedience, fax jams, call jams, uh, and actions in the street, a performative matrix that we could design as a community. Uh, started doing work around blood, critical viruses. This was in response to Jesse Helm saying that a virus had no civil rights. That meant that if you had the virus, you had no civil rights. So how do you uh, manifest protection of the body at the level of blood, if you will? Uh, and how do you a design gestures that invoke that the human is uh, designed to have rights at the level of quantum uh, blood, if you will. Um, so we learned from Susan Sontag uh, that there was this kind of plague uh, that was occurring 
and that uh, often the values of the plague uh, were defined in terms of an American value. Um, and we responded as Critical Art Ensemble uh, to look at the way these planetary viruses were not just the viruses of HIV, uh, but again, that we were bound to ideological viruses, bureaucratic viruses, linguistic viruses, informational in, uh, in, uh, viruses, and technoviruses. And so this was our way to begin to articulate uh, a space for um, micro interventions um, as in each of these areas, uh, kind of early design work, I would say uh, 1989 uh, thereabouts. Um, uh, Susan Tontag was very clear that uh, the spaces of military metaphors uh, were very uh, bound to the question of disease as well as the alien. Uh, bodies that were outside of our immunological defenses, the borders, if you will. And so we were often bound to uh, uh, aggressive actions on a military level. And so you could see uh, some of that in terms of the registers of uh, bodies in the street, um, uh, uh, therapeutic bodies, uh, community research initiatives, designing uh, against uh, the gestures of a, of a governmental and um, a therapeutic state that was not listening. So it was part of a contestational design or tactical media, again, always the small. And I thought this might uh, relate to the catastrophes of the moment in terms of the pandemic uh, and the values that uh, Critical Art Ensemble were involved in. Uh, of course, the famous design by Grand Fury. Uh, by the end of the 80s, we started developing these notions of electronic disturbance, uh, that virtual capitalism would emerge in an accelerated rate in the 90s as the infrastructures of these neoliberal systems would emerge uh, so that the disturbances had to occur and we defined them as electronic civil disobedience uh, using data bodies against data in a nonviolent way. That was not cyber war, cyber terrorism, cyber crime, but designed to articulate a, a different uh, embodiment that we gained from our knowledge of uh, working with ACA, Bates Coalition to Unleash Power. In 1994, and I noted, I noted in, in several of the talks before, the importance of uh, indigenous futurity. In 1994, one minute after midnight, uh, in a scream against the destructions of neoliberalism, the Zapatistas burst, ripped through the electronic fabric and became the first postmodern revolution. And for me, they really were the code switch for developing the practice of electronic civil disobedience. So uh, we became part of the New York Committee for Democracy in Mexico, started uh, learning from uh, Zapatismo to create digital Zapatismo uh, and encountering the design of an indigenous futurity that would train us in the 90s uh, to re-articulate the connection between spaces without connectivity like Chiapas and southernmost uh, Mexico, uh, all the way to the uh, empires of the digital that was New York City, uh, that we could instantiate through tactical gestures, uh, a kind of contestational informatic uh, uh, ecology. And so out of that came the practice of electronic disturbance theater and uh, virtual sit-ins that were transparent in their design, in terms of code, in terms of activism, in terms of presence. We did not hide our data bodies or the code. And this of course created a disturbance in the society of data as anonymity. Um, it quickly developed and I'll, I'll move forward in terms of what these micro gestures uh, perhaps connect to uh, the question of the land as an eco-poetics. The Zapatistas were trying to train us to think uh, the cultural connection between the emergence of data, neoliberalism, virtual capitalism, and what La Tierra, uh, that is the space of La Condon and the Zapatista movement could uh, uh, alert us to in terms of shifting the ecology of action all the way to the battle in Seattle, if you will, are part of digital Zapatismo 
uh, we had battles with the Defense Department, and I won't get into all of that. Uh, so one of the outcomes of, uh, uh, of the planetary scale of immigration really came to the forefront um, in the deportation class action that we did against the German government and Lufthansa. As we know, immigration refugees uh, were uh, already mobilizing throughout the history of the 20th century, but certainly climate change and many other echoes of this ecology uh, were uh, being shut down in terms of uh, the flow and representation of immigrant and refugee uh, culture. And uh, the uh, German government was using Lufthansa, a private company, to deport immigrants and uh, they would mummify them uh, in, in public seating and many of them died. Uh, so we were asked by um, um, No Borders community in Germany to teach uh, individuals about how to do uh, virtual sit-ins. Uh, we pretended to do uh, uh, Lufthansa a deportation class. Uh, we dressed as Lufthansa people and handed information out about what we were gonna do, that is take down Lufthansa. And uh, the day before, uh, stewards and pilots union said they would never fly a deportation class action or flight again and the website went down and uh, there was much uh, uh, response in terms of the first uh, statement in that electronic civil disobedience per uh, the German government became through the courts a right uh, for the civil population to enact these kinds of nonviolent uh, online actions. I ended up uh, in 2004 in uh, San Diego, Tijuana uh, even though I knew about the border, I had not really lived there. I started exploring the border and uh, GPS locative media was important at that time in 2004. We started working with NGOs who left water in the Anza Borrego area in Southern uh, California. And uh, working with them, we developed the transporter immigrant tool, a safety net tool that would lead uh, individuals crossing the desert of the real to water and safety. Um, it was uh, designed uh, and developed by, again, a group of artists. I always work with artists. Uh, it was a move from global positioning systems, which we knew would create uh, legal issues to a geopoetic system. We worked in developing survival poetry in about 12 and 15, or 15 different languages that would allow people to uh, get access to how to read the desert, how to survive in the desert. Um, and it was this poetry uh, that led uh, to the geopoetic definition of the uh, recontestation against uh, uh, the ecology of death that um, Operation Gatekeeper 94 had established through the Sandia Laboratory, and that was uh, uh, prevention through deterrence, where immigrants uh, were forced to go through the Devil's Highway uh, with a guarantee that a high percentage would die. And so this kind of scientific design of pushing people into the devil's highway was part of our uh, analysis to develop this tool. It was also using the dowsing or water witching element. Uh, it would vibrate as you got in, uh, closer to water and were moving in the right direction if you could not read the simple compass. We used the simplest, uh, a porous technology in order to develop the tool. Again, mm -hmm. you don't need massive uh, technologies. We announced it in posters. Uh, people became very angry about the poetry uh, that would help people. Uh, so um, part of these questions of cultural design, uh, cultural interventions in, in terms of the wider Anthropocene and scene certainly came forward in the pandemic. And so um, part of the focus that we've been looking at right now is uh, how does the enemy, again, just like the early days of HIV, um, allow us to re-borderize and re-initialize uh, senses of societal immunity uh, that often uh, brings to the foreground these issues of uh, uh, nationalism at uh, a great height. 
Um, so, uh, you know, uh, I will leave you with some of these images. Um, and we are looking at questions, of course, around uh, the pandemic, uh, what relationships it might have uh, to this history of uh, catastrophes that we have faced uh, from nuclear uh, staging to HIV uh, to um, a current moment. And at the core has always been uh, indigenous futurity uh, as a key uh, element uh, in order to uh, face the future. Uh, and I, I certainly find a lot of the work that all of you are doing uh, as a, a specific area of cognitive mapping and approaches that I think will help us as tactical media artists uh, to begin to suture uh, new sensibilities and devices as uh, we face um, pressures from the Anthropocene across the board, um, beyond the human, of course. And I'll stop there. Thank you. Thank you so much. I'm completely uh, overwhelmed by the uh, thought-provoking uh, content you shared with us today. And this quote by uh, Amy Sarah Carroll, uh, it says, to put the scene in the Anthropocene is one of the most beautiful poetry uh, I've uh, heard. And uh, that's a great, also an introduction to Josh's work. Um, I had the pleasure of meeting Josh uh, when he first uh, moved to Los Angeles when he was a student uh, at USC School of Architecture where I was uh, also teaching. Uh, and um, after a year or so, uh, Josh uh, migrated from School of Architecture to School of Cinematic Arts where number of us had actually done. So we have this really interesting uh, movement that uh, was created between the USC School of Cinematic uh, Arts and USC School of Architecture. So uh, we encourage number of students to take courses in these two departments and create uh, incredible conversations and collaboration. So I'm very excited to have uh, Josh here today. So I will uh, share Josh's uh, bio. Uh, Joshua Shish Dawson is an Indian born award winning filmmaker and designer based in LA. He received a master's in advanced architecture studies from USC where he was the recipient of um, a scholarship uh, which allowed him to travel. He, gained, uh, he trained under Prisker Price award winning uh, architect uh, Doshi as well as Hollywood uh, production designer Alex McDowell where many of us were part of the um, uh, world building lab that Alex had created. This combination has led him to explore world building and storytelling as a speculative fiction tool for architecture, reimagining the built environment through the interdisciplinary design thinking and cinema. So I'm very excited uh, to have Josh joining this conversation. Yeah, all right. Okay, can everyone see my screen and hear me? <clears throat> yes. Okay. Um, you, that was very inspiring for me to, um, to watch everyone's presentation and uh, our Lands Institute was a huge inspiration uh, for me when I, when I was pursuing my master's uh, at USC. So this is very cool. Uh, my work uses the rules of uh, genre filmmaking to, um, whoops, to, uh, to craft narratives that aim to explore and comment on the relationship that exists between uh, policy, the environment, and social class. These films take the form of uh, slice of life stories extracted from holistically built systems or worlds that are extrapolated from research as a form of rhetoric. And because in an odd manner, like almost any tool of cultural production, like we saw so far, like these alternative worlds that we build help in critiquing and shedding light on um, issues that we uh, seem to be grappling with today. My most recent film that is currently on the festival circuit and just screened at the Chattanooga Film Festival, Festival earlier this week uh, is a film called Denervation. Uh, this is a five minute animated uh, docu fiction short uh, set in a world uh, whose premise is built from a Scientific American article that I stumbled across, uh, which details how the increase in high demand for a beauty product, which is made from the most toxic, one of the most toxic substances in the world has 
resulted in its rampant counterfeiting. The article really expounded upon the lax regulatory oversight and insufficient uh, crackdowns on its illicit production, which is merely keeping uh, things a step away from putting a deadly biological weapons agent in the wrong hands. So the film plays out the possibilities of that scenario and examines it through a sort of day in the life of the characters within that world. And the overarching theme uh, really aims to demonstrate how the most valuable commodity that is under siege isn't uh, the counterfeit product or the final end user, but an often overlooked one, which is the air that we breathe. Um, uh, and I stumbled into this, uh, as Bianca was mentioning, I stumbled into this storytelling uh, design film nexus as a medium for critique and social commentary pretty organically through that cross-disciplinary kind of lens that we were looking at our work through at USC. But on as soon as I graduated in that space between graduating and, and, and finding uh, that perfect job and seeking employment in 2016, it was really the period where my own practice uh, originated. And this film, uh, Costico, is based on a future city where in the year 2036 of a generic city, rapid urbanization, climate change, depletion of the ozone layer and drought has placed extreme stress on the state's ability to supply and distribute water to its citizens. So a private company called Turquoise takes complete control of the state's water uh, by using massive siphons to end up over extracting the water from the aquifers underneath the ground. Uh, this over extraction by the company results in the formation of massive subsidence and sinkholes in the city. And these sinkholes are then occupied by the rich and those that can afford water to build their homes closer to the groundwater table, and in the process, giving them the opportunity to take shelter from the harsh conditions of the sun. And while the poor and those that can't afford water are left on the upper levels, leaving them exposed to the sun and dry. Now, uh, that creates a very distinct vertical stratification uh, between the water haves and the water have nots. And um, a series of these siphons, as I call them, are spread across the city as a means to harness the air to ventilate the spaces underground, but also uh, trap moisture from the atmosphere to replenish the groundwater aquifers. And um, these siphons are then connected to a unit underground where the company bottles that same water and sends them back up to the surface uh, through these wells where crates of these bottles are shipped away to far off locations and sold at an extremely high cost back to the people also. And you can watch the film online. It's, it's a short four minute clip with the same frames with sound design and archival news footage sort of narrating the film. Um, and I'll probably put in the link later. But while I was doing research for this project, there was a New York Times article that I read that talked about this little town in the middle of the Atacama Desert called Kiagua. Now, Kiagua happened to be one of the many towns in the region that was on the verge of becoming a ghost town. And last I checked, uh, copper mining accounts for 10% of Chile's uh, GDP and produces a third of the world's global copper output. Now, majority of these mines are located in the Atacama Desert. And these copper mines are supported by a number of sort of support, uh, supplemental ancillary uh, towns. Uh, the lower river who starts in the Andes mountain range and cuts its way through the scorching hot Atacama desert, making it the only source of water for towns like Kiagua and th that were basically meant to supplement the mining industry to survive off of. Now the issue is that these copper mines in the area end up over extracting the lower river uh, and leaving these towns completely dry. And it's important to note that in 2017, Chile was one of the only countries in the world where water was 100% uh, privately owned, which means in Chile's free market, in the interest of economic expansion, these towns are allowed to be completely overlooked. So after, uh, after my previous project, Caustico, received some press, I leveraged it to win a travel fellowship, as Bianca mentioned. And with a drone and a DSLR camera, I embarked on this journey into the Atacama. And a film called uh, Loa's Promise was born. And it, Loa's Promise is a seven minute experimental short film that deals with the dangers of deregulated resource extraction. The film is narrated by the river that writes a letter to a former resident to explain how in a near future, these newly depopulated towns have been retrofit as data centers and crypto mines where that bloody copper is now mined and drawn into wires uh, and laid on laid onto existing infrastructure, uh, creeping through these ghost spaces and recording new memories 
of distant lands by facing the ones that they were uh, once occupying. Uh, the film screened in a variety of different formats from these storefront type spaces in Chicago to large uh, theatrical screens at film festivals around the world, which can sometimes be a little bit intimidating because it was shot on like a, a, a not so great camera and rendered on my laptop. So watching it hold up on a gigantic screens is sort of very surreal. And that obviously follows with its fair share of interviews and pr press and learning to navigate that along the way is always interesting because you're you're completing that feedback loop and you're constantly having to look at your own work through the lens of harsh film critics or people that often know more about these areas than than you uh, where you filmed at. And, uh, and then a few months later, while you're writing that wave, your articles about this fictitious Chile start merging with the reality, what, what happened to become the reality in Chile. And you realize that what you were doing so self-indulgently is aesthetic experiments to strengthen that uh, you know, cinematic design muzzle under this guise of activism, all done while hiding behind my laptop in my apartment is nothing in comparison to the people on the front lines in uh, Chile who have to go through this, who have to fight this battle uh, for themselves and, and have to go through this on a daily basis. And that was sort of a wake up call for me. And since then, <clears throat> I've tried to play a more active role and uh, I've really started to look at my work a lot more differently. So when an interviewer or an audience member at a festival asks you a question like, what do you have to say about, you know, the current riots that were taking place this morning, et cetera, you, you immediately try to think of something uh, smart and cute and witty to say on the spot. But, um, but, but on further reflection and contemplation, you realize that if 10 years down the line, people were to watch uh, this film and not have my particular vision of society resonate with them, because it's uh, no longer a cautionary tale, but a piece of provisionist history, then um, I will gladly accept that. I'm going to stop here uh, so we can have a discussion and um, have a conversation. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, uh, Joshua. It's, it's been really uh, fascinating to see your trajectory just in the past few years and how you have been able to uh, create this uh, projects that actually one feeds to another and, 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 and conversations that you've created around that. Uh, so uh, we're also joined by um, uh, Professor Liliana Gallegos, who uh, joined the panel uh, uh, two days ago on rising social uh, issues. Uh, so um, hopefully uh, she'll be able to also engage in the conversation with us. Uh, so uh, they are, there are many, many uh, points to comment on here. Uh, and um, obviously uh, there's a lot of common threads and uh, rigorous um, research uh, and um, critical analysis is, um, is a foundation for all the work here. Um, interest in information um, now, whether this is acquisition, um, by, you know, let's say, hacking or by looking at existing data or generating information is another threat. But also, um, we are ultimately designers and uh, communicators. So uh, interest in uh, being able to communicate this with the public and sometimes policymakers is, um, is, an, is an important aspect. Uh, but as somebody who is uh, trying to navigate this uh, world of um, academia, research, but also production, uh, I find myself often um, um, ask this question of uh, how do you measure success? How do you know when your work has had impact? And sometimes uh, these questions could be uh, framed uh, in terms of perhaps uh, if there's a supporting institution, if there's a, if there's a collective agenda. Uh, but a, a lot of the work that we're seeing here, so for instance, with Gabrielle's uh, exhibition uh, and the, the, the curatorial work with Joshua's, um, uh, let's say, um, uh, uh, the, um, the screening uh, tour that you were on or with Ricardo's uh, 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 reactionary uh, different, uh, let's say, gradient of reactions that you've had towards the work and would have these um, engagement and participation in different conversations. 
So I'm curious, um, how do you um, how do you measure um, success? How do you uh, when you look at your work and reflect back? How do you know if you uh, your work uh, has reached the right audience, or if that's even uh, something to consider? So I'm I'm curious if you could comment on that. Um, should I uh, do? I need to raise my hand, or please go ahead. Okay. Well, I think it's easier to have a sense of social outcome and measurement uh, based on tactical media gestures. Uh, I, I don't know about strategic work that uh, uh, some of the others are doing, but tactical gestures often carry with them a kind of art as social practice and contestation. And so there's often, uh, as one would in protests in the streets, encounter direct response. Uh, so that's one measure that is social activation uh, beyond the gesture or community that you're involved in. Uh, the other layer I suppose that is important is, um, can the work uh, be copied or code switched in a way that meets the needs of other communities that weren't part of your initial conversation? And so say with hacktivism, we were able to give uh, the communities around the world a code, which was quite simple JavaScript. And out of that then came communities that were not bound to art, but to social practices on a planetary scale. So the sharing of the code, I think was important and the use. And certainly you can see with a transporter immigrant tool, that there are echoes around the use of GPS, like with the alarm phone system in the Mediterranean, um, um, watch the med, um, where you have communities trying to help immigrants crossing the Mediterranean uh, using uh, similar uh, aspects of the transporter immigrant tool. So you have that kind of social echolalia that I think does offer you some measurement uh, and sensibility uh, beyond just power saying we're angry at you, uh, but that other social uses develop. Uh, so I, I suppose uh, I think micro gestures and tactical media are, have an easier time measuring sort of process and outcome as opposed to kind of large scale strategic elements, which I think have a, a deeper durational time of consideration and a really large scale infrastructure of needs. I'll stop there. Thank you very much. Please, uh, whoever wants to follow. I, th I, I think uh, Professor uh, Dr. Gallegos wants to comment. <laughs> Hello, uh, thank you so much for your presentations. Uh, Dr. Dominguez, my uh, comment is for you. Uh, I just wanna say I'm from the border as well. So it is Tijuana, San Diego. And uh, your work is very inspirational to me, especially because you are conscious of, or you're creating consciousness around the places from which we are receiving this information for for future uh, design or future implementation that is actually coming from our past, right? From many of our pasts, from our different, you know, indigenous uh, uh, histories. And also right now, because we are still indigenous, it's not from the past, it's from now. So I, I just wanted to thank you for that. And I wanna ask you, um, what, what do you think the future of the transborder right looks like? Because I, I understand from your work that you have a transborder right sensibility that it's, it's transfronterizo. Um, how, where do you see us going? Um, well, I certainly think that for me, what has been important in terms of digital Zapatismo and Zapatismo is that indigenous futurity, that is the messages from the future are ones that are built in terms of how do we read the past and the present. And certainly indigenous culture allows us to see one that perhaps the border does not exist in the most utopian sense, right? Since indigenous lands 
uh, are not uh, borderized. But at the same time that we understand that the empire of the US and empires around the world do create a violence of borders. So I, one of the things that I work with my students with is speculative design. And so what are instances that uh, these kind of borders can dissolve, if you will, and they can be done through poetry, certainly, uh, they can be done through artivist gestures, and they can be done through the kind of strategic architectural design that I think the colleagues here are looking at, right? Uh, uh, rights of water, rights of land, rights of air. Um, and so I guess uh, for me, it's difficult to think strategically about el transfronteriso sensibility, right? Uh, so what I would say for me right now is uh, one of my concerns is dronology, the use of homeland security, use of unmanned aerial vehicles that are developed here at UCSD, right? I'm here at the very heart where these engines are being created. So, and I'll stop here, but so what I'm developing is called a palindrome, which is a copy of the predator drone that will chase the Homeland Security drones and sing to them the voices of the border, the voices of indigenous poetry, Gloria and Saldua, Norte, uh, La Voces Transfronteriza. So um, it's a micro gesture. It doesn't disassemble the border, but it reassembles it towards another uh, futurity. So I'll stop there. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you for the question. Um, I was wondering if, uh, if Hadi, if you'd like to comment on um, kind of, uh, perhaps uh, I'm very much curious about the, the, sh the shift of focus, uh, shift of focus in, in the practice. Uh, and, and I wonder if uh, going back to the question I had about evaluation, and not so much in terms of uh, qualitative versus quantitative, uh, but uh, I'm, I'm curious, uh, how do you kind of uh, evaluate uh, impact of the work and whether that's changed um, since mm. you shift focus? Mm. Um, so uh, it depends on what we're describing as the work to be evaluated. Um, so the tool is working if we have convinced someone it's worth spending strategically, as Ricardo says, uh, on these prioritized places to make your people, your properties, your economies, your landscapes safe. So simply somebody saying yes. W listen, there's no insufficiency of data. We've seen today there is no insufficiency of imagination, and there sure as heck in this planet is not an insufficiency of cash. The world is awash with cash. Making an argument for you want to make this change and making that argument to people who are not artists. I, I'm, I'm suffering from some, um, uh, what is it called on social media? Some, some fear of missing out today. Uh, the, 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 the quantitative uh, measure, the, excuse me, the qualitative measures of um, producing beauty and producing compelling arguments and uh, producing eco poetry and producing change through that uh, is not what uh, is an, uh, a measure of success in what we've chosen to do at this moment. It's a narrower bandwidth. Somebody has to say, yes, I need that tool. Somebody needs to pay for the service. Somebody needs to then find they've produced a water result that saves them money because the, 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 the enterprise in a way is predicated on uh, we've got to make the case that it's worth paying for. It's a failure if the um, tactics of the kind that Ricardo and Gabriel and Joshua have um, shared and spoken to aren't meeting the strategic. But we can't all do 
every kind of um, color on the on the spectrum. We can't work at each scale. I just want to say uh, I feel like we're all working in a docu fiction here. Some of us tilting a little bit more to documentary. Some of us tilting more to fiction, and the the two together are so powerful. And the strategic and the tactical working together will happen probably off an evaluation. Uh, um, uh, metric or uh, matrix and off a timetable um, th that I get to see. I think we actually are working into something that is supposed to propel itself beyond um, our own individual actually lives and homes and practices. I, I'm not sure I, I answered the question. We'll succeed when uh, we have 150 cities doing this work uh, uh, strategically in the next three years is one way to answer the question. Uh, we'll really be succeeding when artists and communities are engaging it to say, oh, it's not just about the grocery store parking lot. It's also about uh, what did we get for our children's uh, futures out of this or the ability to produce food in our neighborhood uh, or the ability to stay safe uh, multi-generationally, design new relationships, transmit, transfer uh, those um, uh, relationships and create place and rootedness again. Thank you so much. That, that's, that's encouraging. So uh, ultimately when we're able to uh, align, uh, it goes back to the, the prompt we have for this. So the kind of the immediate, um, immediate um, needs or uh, desires of the public, which might be monetary to the long term. Uh, I, I think that's, that's, that's um, encouraging. Uh, Gabriel, I was wondering if you want to comment on um, an assessment of your work. Um, if, uh, yeah some perspective uh, because well my work is different from uh, well each each one I think has a very specific um, although, although there is this kind of convergence of interests we are ex expressing ourselves through different means uh, means right um, and I think in a in, in a work about history like a, the book is more difficult to quantify of course uh, how, how many people read, uh, what the impact will have in the future. or So I don't know how to answer for that one. Um, but for, for instance, for the work uh, on mapping, uh, we had some interesting feedbacks that we weren't expecting. For example, the, um, we, we did this map that I presented about the flying rivers and the, the humidity in the atmosphere. Um, uh, we got a message from that we were, weren't expecting at all from the Institute of Space Research from Brazil saying, look, this is the moment art meets uh, what we've been studying on paper for, for uh, uh, a decade. Um, it's a moment in which we can actually see to art what we've been uh, theorizing and gathering data, gathering kind of, kind of, kind of cold data. So they bought a replica of the of the map, not they bought, it was for free, but uh, they replicated, they asked the permission to replicate the map and now it's in their lobby. So I think um, sometimes it reaches people you, you don't expect it to reach, right? And we had another case when we put the maps for sale, uh, uh, for sale to help the indigenous people in Brazil, um, we got a person from Austria that saw our exhibition in Venice and then saw the announcement of the maps and decided to buy uh, in a, in a very, with a very generous um, uh, kind of amount, uh, uh, a price. They came completely out of the blue. A guy from Austria saw our work two years ago, uh, two years before uh, in Venice, and now is helping indigenous people in Brazil through the work. So I think this um, nowadays, when the work's not uh, direct, for instance, uh, on my design work, I build stuff, I see it there, and I see how it impacts people. But this kind of more um, speculative work or work that demands a sort of um, um, the telling of a story or the, the it has a sort of activist uh, mentality on it, meaning that let's put the problem out there, let's um, say what people don't want us to say, let's uh, show that something's wrong. And then down the line, Someone will see. Someone will will pick up on that. Uh, pick up on that, and 
and you know these two examples are just uh, and two very specific anecdotes. But um, we had other people coming to us and say, "Look, we saw this somewhere. Hey, come here, talk here. Hey, let's uh, let's visit this 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 community together." So it's interesting. Um, I don't know exactly. I cannot put that as a map uh, in a methodology or you know. Um, but I know through the experience what has has uh, happened, right? So in, in the sense, uh, what I want to say is that um, in this work that's almost self-generated and uh, it demands to, to send a message more than to build something physical, I think um, the, the idea is to put it out there in the world and see uh, who, who it in, in impacts. Some, sometimes I don't even know who, who is seeing it. I think it might be the same with Joshua. He doesn't know who, who is seeing the work, but it's maybe inspiring people, especially in a moment in which we have to talk about the kind of uh, atrocities that are happening everywhere. You know, So it's better to be out there, someone speaking, because with me, other one, someone else will speak, maybe someone else will speak. The same way I was um, inspired by other people that don't know that I was inspired by them. Yeah, so, so uh, in a sense, uh, Josh, if you can comment on it, but I, it, this ties back to Ricardo's comment about can the work be copied? Can it, uh, can it be openly accessed in a sense? Yeah, did you, did you want me to comment? Oh, yeah, no, I, I just wanted to yeah, sort of, yeah, uh, yeah, I just wanted to sort of uh, kind of like piggyback off of what Gabriel was saying, you know, he, he said during his presentation, a properly contained question contains half its answer. And I, I really like that phrase because that's essentially what it is that my work is trying to do. It's really using fiction as a vehicle to navigate the sorts of research that, uh, you know, like, for example, Haley is doing, and then trying to understand how I can use that as a way that I'm able to process it in a much more uh, embodied manner in a way that kind of affects me and then try to, um, you know, disseminate that and share it with a group of people. And I, I absolutely agree. Like, I have no idea, you know, how far the work is going to go, who the work is going to reach. And, you know, the cultural sensitivity at that particular moment, you know, I spend a year, a year and a half to two years, like working on some of these projects, and they're all self-initiated. And it's, it's kind of interesting to think about, you know, when I started the project, the world when I started and then the world after it's done and after it's on this, the festival circuit. And it's just, it's just seeing like growing with that work and then making sure that the audience are able to kind of connect with it either in a way that it's, it's too like jarring or pressing uh, for the moment, or if it's too, uh, you know, it, it's too uh, something that can be cautionary for something that's a lot more further down. And I think that the idea of, um, I, I just also kind of wanted to take that that research that Gabrielle kind of disseminated of, you know, like the big, large scale visions of, of, um, of what the world is going to look like. And, you know, as a person of color, it's it's always fascinating for me to see those lists and like see very few people, um, you know, on those lists that are people of color or from the global south, you know, actually doing that sort of uh, work. And I think my I, at some point, do want to be able to kind of contribute to that so that in the future, whether that's 50 or 100 years later, someone is able to kind of chart that and document that and critique it in a way. And I think also, you know, with, with the map that Hadley showed, with the, the uh, kind of Indus Valley civilization uh, area, like in North India, the, the way that I was particularly taught uh, about those indigenous kind of methods of, uh, of you know, transferring water and storing water was always about how great they were as aesthetic marvels and aesthetic pieces of architecture. But no one ever looked at how equally uh, efficient they were in terms of strat stratification, whether that was based on gender or whether that was based on caste or, you know, a color of skin and or, or whatever rule they belong to. And I think that, th that if, if, you know, 20 years, 10 years down the line, we're able to constantly keep that mapping going and we're constantly able to look at it at the moment at the cultural sort of zeitgeist of the moment overlay that and then extract what we need to from that piece then i i think that that's that's the most uh, kind of you know uh, important uh intention of that work i would say 
So the, uh, one of the people in this field that I really uh, look up to, uh, Sarah Williams, um, teaches at MIT. She just uh, released this book a few months ago called Data Action, Using Data for Public Good. And uh, when she was uh, talking about this work, um, she talked about a visualization that um, uh, Sarah Williams and Laura Kurgan from uh, Columbia Graduate School of Architecture and Planning uh, created in late uh, 2000s, which took that relationship of race and and um, and um, prison uh, prison statistics in, in, in New York bureaus. And uh, she was commenting on how um, with uh, uh, with last uh, summer's uh, Black Lives Matter protests, the same visualizations uh, after a decade were used in a lot of um, conversations, either pro or against um, certain uh, aspects that the visualization initially was intended to highlight. So <clears throat> at least in this case for her, um, I, although as the creator, as somebody who's authoring the work and initially you have certain intention, you do tend to have certain reservations in terms of, well, I didn't intend A or B, or, well, this visualization is outdated, the data is different. However, perhaps the, um, the key here is to uh, focus on production of critical work that actually generates these conversations, uh, perhaps uh, years and years after um, the release time. And I think that's what you were mentioning about your work. and. The fact that perhaps that's the best we could wish as um, as as as, uh, as creatives, as uh, as um, researchers who are in, interested in creating this intersection. Um, so um, I was wondering if uh, anybody would like to comment on perhaps the legacy of the work, or uh, perhaps how do you see uh, this relationship of time and production in relationship to your work. Maybe you um, can add something super quick. Go ahead. Um, sorry, Gabriel. So, sorry, it's going to be super quick. I, it's just that everything that we do in the end uh, uh, has a price tag on it. So there is so much money that we spend on doing these things. It can be you know, our time or it can be someone else's time or it can be just like direct money that uh, we apply to something, right? So when we do like when I was uh, co-curating the Brazilian Pavilion, we had a budget uh, uh, and we had the responsibility to make something public out of that budget, right? So, I mean, they don't allow, they don't ask us to do that. They actually do, you know, you do whatever you want. But then when you get money that's public, uh, it starts becoming kind of a responsibility. So I think um, there, there is something that's beyond just the, the the media or the feedback you're going to get later there is a sort of attitude of how do you uh, behave or how do you create your work uh, in a moment in which there's so many so much disparity and so uh, and 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 we're talking about in, uh, creating a more inclusive environment right so i think um everyone's work here, there is a sort of a sense that we need to use our resources properly and, and make a statement out of that, I think. Uh, yeah, I, I do think it's important to consider the kinds of infrastructures, uh, both in terms of the cost of those infrastructures and uh, what the kind of gesture that one is developing adds to it or, you know, changes it or shifts it. I think as Haley was saying, how do you shift uh, funds towards other, other directions? And I think the, the question of strategic funding is much more difficult because it's so many scales and, and markets that one has to deal with. I would say that at least in, in terms of tactical media, um, it's much less expensive in terms of production and making um, so that uh, the issues perhaps aren't as large scale uh, or scalable. Uh, but nonetheless, they do become crucial. And I think Gabrielle is, is right. That is the funding that we use for the transporter immigrant tool 
uh, over 10 years from 2004 to its use was under $5,000. And that $5,000 came uh, from uh, California Information Technology 2 lab that I was a principal investigator at UCSD. But when Congress discovered the tool, right, they said that was public money. So that $5,000 then became the crux by which Congress could then say, we were traitors to the nation because we used this public funding and could then start the investigations. So, you know, the, the amount of funding one receives and where it comes from could be minimal, but where it's attached to socially can be, um, you know, can stop a project, right? Um, and so I think that is, uh, I think, a, a key in terms of research. Uh, and I, I, just to go back, I think tactical media, micro gestures are less expensive and so are perhaps somewhat easier to produce, but they do take a long time to make. I would say that all the gestures I've been involved in take about 10 years from initial idea concept to prototype to, uh, uh, you know, passing it out into the world. And I think that's a certain kind of social cost in terms of developing work. Um, and, and some work gets a lot of funding and can happen very quickly. And some work isn't seeking that level of funding and, and is much slower and durational. Um, so cost and benefits, I think, are also driven by project sort of matrix of development and design. Um, anyway, I'll stop there. Thank you so much. Uh, I completely agree that um, we know that a relationship of policy to funding is absolutely important. And in the uh, words of uh, Shoshana Zuboff in her work, uh, The Age of Surveillance Capitalism, who knows who decides, who decides, who decides. So. Perhaps we are that in that second who decides, but definitely who decides who decides is where uh, a lot of conversation ultimately, um, a lot of challenge and a lot of clash uh, takes place. Uh, we are coming to the end of uh, the hour. Uh, I would like to see if our panelists have any closing comments. Uh, it's been an absolute joy to see your work and uh, see them in relationship to one another. So if you have any closing comments, please go ahead. Uh, well, I guess I'll just say, I wanna thank uh, Joshua and Gabrielle, Liliana and Haley. Uh, I know she had to leave, uh, but I find the, the sense of cultural imaginary cognitive mapping and deep uh, data gathering to be so vital and important. And uh, these kind of strategic gestures have always been important for me. Uh, and the groups that I've worked with to learn from. So I really thank you all, and certainly the Transfronterizos también uh, that I learned from. Uh, so thank you. Yeah, thank you. Uh, thank you all. It's It's been really inspiring to be able to present alongside you and have a, engage in this conversation. Um, you know, it's, it's just so fascinating to see the range of, you know, tactical visualization, information visualization, and narrative, like how, how that kind of Broadly, uh, you know, talk, we're talking. We're all talking about similar thematic. We all have similar thematic underpinnings in our work, and that's uh, really inspiring uh, for me to see how everyone is doing it in such unique and different ways. So, thank you all for presenting. Yes, thank you very much. It has been super inspiring, and also, I, I love this type of conversations because sometimes you see that we're going, although. Uh, Everything has a kind of, kind of a common ground here. Um, we see some areas that maybe we could pay more attention to, or um, I don't know, it's just a learning process. That's, uh, that's fantastic. I can't hear, but I can speak. Uh, I just wanna say maybe one measure of evaluating um, the worth of the work is seeing 15 years later, uh, somebody pulled together as thoughtfully as you have a group of people who are thinking in such critical, wise, inspired, passionate ways 
from so many different angles and portals and to have the result be, I would like to be in further conversation with these folks. I just really want to say thank you. Really a gift. Thank you so much. I'm extremely inspired and um, I would love to see how we could continue this conversation. And I also would like to thank uh, Dr. Gallegos for joining uh, our session today and uh, also behind the scene, uh, Gustavo Rincon, Virgia Melnik and Marina um, uh, who has been uh, who have been along with me uh, co-curating the session. So thank you so much. Have a wonderful day and let's continue creating beautiful work uh, and uh, we'll see what happens. Have a great day. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Adios. Gracias. De nada. Adios. Muchas Liliana. gracias. Adios, Buenísimo Gustavo. su trabajo. Adios. Gracias. Ahí los vemos otra vez. <laughs>